Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel today. We'll still be letting people in over the next few minutes, but we are going to get started. So thank you for spending your lunch with us for the Sustainability Council's World Environment Day panel. My name is Valerie Miller, and I'm going to be your moderator today. I completed my PhD at the University of Alberta in land reclamation, and I'm now the coordinator of the U of A's Land Reclamation International Graduate School. Today, we are thrilled to spend the next hour with Aneri Greg Garg, whose graduate work was about coral restoration, and Dr. Justine Karst, an associate professor in the Department of Renewable Resources, whose research focuses on the role that mycorrhizae play in forest restoration. So there is an increased focus on the importance of reclaiming and restoring damaged ecosystems as highlighted with the recent launch of the UN's Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. The earth supports all life from bacteria to humans and as such a healthy earth is essential for healthy communities. The goal of this next decade is to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. Before our speech speakers join us to share their work, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. As we talk about our research to restore the health of ecosystems, it is essential to acknowledge the communities whose past, present, and future is an integral part of the land and the rights of Indigenous peoples to steward their ancestral lands. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. For myself, I respectfully acknowledge my current presence on Treaty 18 land, traditional lands of Indigenous peoples, including the Petun, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, and Wendat Neowetzio. And Ineri is located at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center within the traditional territory of the Huayat First Nation, a member of the Manolf Modern Day Treaty on Vancouver Island. We would love to know where you are joining us from as well today. So if you wanna put that in the chat, we would love to hear. This talk is part of the Sustainability Counselor Lecture Series during the academic year, we host interdisciplinary scholars, professionals, and activists who engage with sustainability, climate change, and the environment. These lectures are usually bi-weekly throughout the academic year. Please note that we are recording this lecture and it will be published on the YouTube channel so you can watch it again or share it with anyone who can't attend. However, the audience will not appear in the published video. Each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to share their work followed by a question period and discussion at the end. Feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout the talks, and I will do my best to share as many of them with our speakers as possible. So let's get started. Neri, the floor is yours. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for the intro, and thanks for having me chat with you all today. Um, Yes, happy World Environment Day, and I have to put a plug in for happy belated World Oceans Day, which was yesterday. Um, as Valerie said, my name is Aneri, and I recently completed my master's at the University of Alberta in the Global Aquatic Change Lab under the supervision of Dr. Stephanie Green. So I'm excited to do a little bit of a whirlwind of my master's re research and to chat with you guys today. Um, to start, I'm just gonna set up some of the ecological theory behind my research, just to make sure we're all on the same page with the vocabulary I'll be using. So at its core, habitat patch selection is understanding where animals live and why. So in ecosystems where the primary habitat builders are living plants and animals, the habitat forming organisms are called foundational species. And the animals that rely on them are called secondary species. So these ecosystems are widespread and can be terrestrial or aquatic, for example, grasses in a prairie grassland, trees in a forest, or oysters in an oyster reef. So within these ecosystems, a small cluster of foundational species is called a habitat patch. And you can think of it like a chunk of habitat within the ecosystem. And since foundational species are living organisms, the habitat they make are also called biogenic habitat. 
So for example, on coral reefs, corals are the foundational species and provide critical biogenic habitat for a diversity of secondary species, including fish communities. And although they look a lot like weird and wonderful underwater plants, corals are actually animals in the phylum Cnidaria. So they're related to jellyfish. And on coral reefs, sclerotinian corals are those that lay down the calcium carbonate skeleton that make up a majority of the structurally complex habitat. And since they're biogenic habitats, they're made of living organisms. So they have both abiotic and biotic features which are hypothetical complexity. And the second is their substrate position, essentially the living tissue they're made of. So basically what they look like and what they're made of are hypothesized to influence habitat selection by fishes. But why do we even care about fish? They're really beautiful. Some of them are pretty tasty, but they're also really important ecologically. And more and more research is showing just how interdependent foundational and secondary species are to each other. So in the context of global habitat degradation, understanding features of biogenic, biogenic habitat that enhance selection of diverse secondary species may help in restoration and conservation efforts. Unfortunately, and it may come as no surprise to you that coral reefs are dying at unprecedented rates. And reports of coral bleaching have made their way into mainstream media news outlets even more frequently in recent years. At a global scale, the primary stress to corals are from rising ocean temperatures and acidification from at excess atmospheric heat and carbon being absorbed by the ocean. And at a regional scale, so for example, in the Florida Keys at our study site, local disturbances such as coral disease, increased storm frequency, overfishing, pollution, or sedimentation can compound upon the stress from warmer and acidic waters, pushing coral reefs into further decline. But what does this actually look like on a reef? Pictured here is Cary's Fort Reef in 1975, and this is our study site. And then a decade later in 1985, we can see there's a lot of color and structural complexity provided by living corals. Unfortunately, in each subsequent decade, the increased frequency and magnitude of disturbances has led to a loss of the living tissue by the loss of color and a flattening of the three-dimensional structural complexity from the coral loss reducing an even less, reducing habitat space for fishes and secondary species. In light of these disturbances, one of the local management opportunities that has arisen is coral restoration. And it's a process analogous to tree planting where little coral fragments are grown in a nursery and then what's called outplanted onto a reef. And in the Florida Keys, the Coral Restoration Foundation are our main collaborators and they employ this method method for coral reef restoration. So the photo on the right here is showing an area where there's ongoing restoration. And this is also called a coral tree. So this is the nursery that's out in the ocean growing the baby corals. So specifically, my research focuses on the effect of coral restoration on fish recruitment. And that's the process where fish larvae move from the open ocean onto reefs as juveniles. It's an important ecological process which influences healthy adult fish populations. And it's also a time when juvenile fish show strong selection to coral reef habitats. So to study this process, we developed a framework to describe the different phases and mechanisms driving juvenile reef fish habitat selection. We propose that biogenic habitat selection to habitat patches has two main stages. The first is the attraction phase, when fishes detect and navigate towards habitat using cues from habitat features. And the second is the retention phase, when fishes stay and use the resources at a habitat. So try and identify what initially attracts a fish and then what encourages them to stay there. So let's say that you're a fish and you're on the housing market looking for a new home. Are you gonna go to the house where the real estate agent has baked cookies? So maybe there's some cues there indicating a quality habitat. Or do you not really care and you just want five bedrooms? So likely both features influence the habitat selection. All right, but what about the neighborhood? Are you a fish that cares if your new house is next to a big empty parking lot? Or do you care if it's a mixed use neighborhood? The surrounding structural context may also play a role in which habitat patches fishes select and retain to. And even coral reefs have structurally diverse landscapes or what we might call a reefscape on a reef. <laughs> 
While a habitat patch may only take up an area of a meter or a few square meters, at the scale of 50 to 100 meters, the reef may be an important driver. And one of the most simple ways to measure this on a reef is by approximating vertical relief. So on the left, we have a picture of a high relief reefscape, and on the right, a low relief reefscape that's a lot flatter. So essentially, when a juvenile fish is looking to choose and then stay at a coral habitat patch, I'm trying to understand, will it select for patches with just structurally complex features or patches with structural complexity features and living coral tissue? And then does this reefscape structural complexity mediate that response? So in, in digging into this research, we found that one of the most common approaches to try and disentangle these two features um, have been by using artificial habitats. Unfortunately, we found that a lot of the artificial structures used for this kind of study are either really expensive, don't scale up, or don't actually look like corals. Fortunately, we had some access to some new technologies and some old school paleontology tricks. So we developed a method called 3D SPMC, which scans for 3D scan, print, molding, and casting. And so what we see here on the first video is um, a scan of a coral, so a coral skeleton. We then use that 3D file to print replicates. And then this is where the paleontology tricks come in. Using those replicates, we could create flexible silicone molds and then rapidly cast with concrete to create highly realistic artificial habitats. So this method can be scaled up, it's affordable, and it also mimics the structural complexity of newly augmented. And as I mentioned, our study took place at Cary's Fort Reef. This is in the Northern Florida Keys. And we selected four 24 by six meter plots to conduct this experiment where no previous outplanning had been done. And these plots were placed in two kinds of reefscapes. The two outlined in blue were further inshore and had high relief reefscapes, while the two outlined in yellow were further offshore and had low relief reefscapes, so a lot flatter. And then to test the relative effect of habitat composition and structure, we outplanted coral clusters at consistent densities, but manipulated the ratio of living and artificial corals in each cluster. So these five treatments represent the proportion of living coral in each treatment. So for example, the 0% treatment would consist of 10 artificial corals. And in this photo, this is the 50% treatment where there's five living and five artificial corals. And importantly, we also had a control treatment where no corals were outplanted and served as a baseline to compare to. So we'll see if the fish can tell which ones are real and which ones are fake. Then within each of these study plots, the treatments were equally represented and randomly stratified. And I'm not sure if you're keeping up with the math here, but this experimental design meant that we had to create at least 400 artificial corals. And fortunately, we had some very dedicated research assistants to help in this process. Um, so here are some shots of the assembly and construction process. We even used the very high-tech option of a canoe and soaked all the artificial modules in seawater for at least two weeks to make sure that any of the cues associated with the concrete were leached out beforehand. Then with the help of an amazing army of interns and staff from the Foundation, Foundation, we outlined all 800 coral fragments, 400 living, 400 artificial, um, over two days. And so these are some of the photos and videos of the outlining process. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, on the left is a video of a habitat patch in a high complexity reef, where there's a lot more vertical relief compared to a video on the right where it's a lot flatter and a low relief reef. We then came back to visit each habitat patch and count juvenile fish individuals within a one meter area of each of those coral clusters over the 50 day study period. So what did we actually find? So I'm just gonna orient you here with the graphs. First of all, on the left, this is just showing um, baseline recruitment levels. So this is where no corals were added to the reefscape. And what we see is that generally there's higher recruit densities in high reefscape areas, which is unsurprising given that they're very structurally complex environments. All right, but what about when you add a structurally complex coral cluster? So to orient with you to the plots on the right, we have low relief and high relief reefscapes and then the metrics of either attraction or retention on the y-axis. And keep in mind that the zero line here represents baseline recruitment levels. 
So a value above means that there's a positive effect and a value below means that there's a negative effect relative to baseline recruitment. And what we notice is that adding structurally complex habitat patches to reefscapes with low relief has higher attraction and retention of juvenile reef fish relative to background levels. So essentially where it's a very flat reefscape, adding a little goes a long way for both attraction and retention. The second trend that stood out to us was surprising. We see a non-linear trend emerge in both attraction and retention metrics with a consistent non-linear direction, but slightly dampened effect in high relief reefscapes. So essentially we saw the most fish in coral clusters with either all 10 living or all 10 artificial corals. And for some reason, they did not tend to associate with intermediate proportions of living coral. I don't have too much time to go into the, into the mechanisms behind this, uh, but we can definitely save that for later. What I do wanna to touch on is what does this actually mean for restoration? So the first thing that was clear from the study is that adding corals to low relief reefscapes both attracts and retains juvenile reef fish. However, it's likely that as fish grow, they'll depend on the habitat in different ways and at different spatial scales. So we recommend longer term studies and to look at adult fish communities on restored coral reefs. The second thing is that substrate composition is an important feature to attraction and retention, but in a pattern unexpected to what we hypothesize and likely driven by species or trait specific responses. And one thing to note here is that we, we agree with other researchers that artificial corals should not be used to achieve wide scale restoration, rather in pilot studies like the one described here to better understand their ecological functioning. And finally, it's clear that habitat complexity and composition interact in complex ways. So we suggest further investigation is needed and that the 3D SPMC method can be modified to answer other ecological questions or similar questions in different ecosystems. So understanding habitat features which enhance the positive feedback loops between biogenic habitats and secondary species is important in the context of habitat restoration. So we recommend that more restoration programs should start or continue to monitor entire community dynamics as a measure of restoration success. And just to give you a little bit of a sneak peek, I'm now at the Banfield Marine Science Center. And there's a lot of really great work even happening on the coast here um, and some restoration in eelgrass meadows, kelp forests or stream restoration. And just to give you a sneak peek, I'm now working on a project to develop a webinar series on climate action that features some of the great research and conservation measures happening here. So stay tuned for that. Um, with that, I just wanna say thanks so much for coming today and having me. And just a quick note to also say that habitat restoration is an awesome tool to sustain ecosystems and even can be used to restore human nature relationships. However, even though they degree a local some degree of local resilience, it's important to consider also who is most immediately impacted by ecosystem changes, who benefits from restoration, and then to pair these efforts with bold climate policy towards drastically cutting carbon emissions. That's all for me. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fascinating. I have friends watching this and they definitely want to know why you saw that result in your data. So we'll get into that later. Uh, Justine, you can jump on and share your screen, but Anari, while you're still on here, I found it fascinating that you uh, found less fish on kind of the smoother habitat and that's where it had greater effect of adding those reef, because I found the exact same results in my research in the Arctic, where I had smooth ecosystems, I had a lot fewer plants present, and as soon as I built microtopography there, that's where I saw the increased plant presence and I didn't see the impact of that microtopography on those rougher, naturally rougher ecosystems. So exact same results, entirely different ecosystems. Yeah, that's so interesting. All right, Justine, the floor is now yours. We will get into more of this discussion at the end. And if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, double check so everyone can see my slides. Yes, okay, thank you. I guess everyone says that to start their talk, hey? 
Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I'm Justine Karst. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Renewable Resources here at the U of A. So welcome to the UN Decade on Restoration. And we rely on ecosystems to produce our food and water, to control climate and diseases, to cycle nutrients, produce oxygen, and of course, for our cultural well-being. But there is simply not enough intact ecosystems to deliver the services on which we depend. And ecosystem restoration is a solution to this problem and it's necessary to restore biodiversity, ecosystem function, and I would argue also to um, restore our relationship with nature. Um, it can also be a natural solution to climate change in that uh, there are techniques we can use to draw down carbon from the air um, to help mitigate some of the changes we're seeing. And according to the UN, I'm going to read this quote because I think it's uh, quite fascinating. Uh, the UN says, so between now and 2030, the restoration of 350 million hectares of degraded terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems could generate 9 trillion US dollars in ecosystem services. Restoration could also remove 13 to 26 gigatons of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The economic benefits of such interventions exceed nine times the cost of investment, whereas inaction is at least three times more costly than ecosystem restoration. So ecosystem restoration can provide tremendous benefits. So what is ecosystem restoration? Uh, ecosystem restoration is assisting the recovery of ecosystems that have been degraded or destroyed. And I wanna be clear, as humans, we can only create the conditions for organisms to do all the work of restoring. So sometimes this means moving or removing the threat to ecosystems. So for example, reducing grazing pressure in grasslands, or sometimes it means actually intervening. So we would intervene in the system by um, things like seeding or transporting uh, in, or transplanting individuals. So as part of creating those conditions for restoration to happen, we must provide those organisms the things that they need to establish, grow, and reproduce. And much of ecosystem restoration centers on restoring plant communities. But to survive in the world, plants don't go at it alone. They have help from fungi. And to be specific, fungi that colonize their roots and form associations called mycorrhizas. And these are an ancient and widespread association. So over 80% of terrestrial plant species form mycorrhizas. And these fungi, they influence many features of ecosystem restoration, namely plant diversity, ecosystem carbon sequestration, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on for my talk. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about mycorrhizas. So they are generally considered mutualisms. Like most organisms, fungi rely on carbon for their energy. And fungi forming mycorrhizas, forming mycorrhizas long ago lost their ability to degrade or organic matter to get that carbon. So today they rely on their living plant hosts to acquire that carbon. So their host plants, they photosynthesize, they produce sugars, and about 20% of those sugars are allocated below ground to support those mycorrhizal fungi. The fungi through their very small size, and in some cases, the enzymes that they produce and release in the soils can tap into nutrients that are otherwise unavailable to plants. So in exchange for carbon, they send nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus to their plant hosts. And there are two main types of mycorrhizas, ectomycorrhizas and herbuscular mycorrhizas. And I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit about what they look like. So mycorrhizas form on the fine roots of plants. So if you can imagine a root system and the terminal roots, that's where you see mycorrhizas. If you were to take a cross section of a root, one of those fine roots, if it was non-mycorrhizal, it might look something like this. So you can see the root cells and kind of how they're arranged. When it is an ectomycorrhizal root, it looks different. So this blue, this is all fungal tissue. And you can see that an ectomycorrhizal root has fungi that grows, that basically envelops that little root with fungal tissue. And it also grows in between root cells. 
and where it grows in between, this is the site of nutrient exchange. So the plants, the carbon from the plants is gonna to flow to the carbon or to the fungi here, and the fungi are going to release nutrients to the plant. So ectomycorrhizas, they are present mostly in conifers and some deciduous trees. In ectomycorrhizae fungi, they produce a lot of enzymes. So they need a lot of energy, which means they respire a lot of carbon. And ectomycorrhizae fungi are very good at mining organic matter for nutrients. So this is different. So our vascular mycorrhizae fungi is shown here. So they look different in that the first thing you probably notice is that our vascular mycorrhizal root is not enveloped in fungal tissue in the same way that ectomycorrhizal roots are. Instead, these are vascular mycorrhizae fungi. They actually grow and they penetrate these little root cells and they grow these structures called arbuscules. And these arbuscules are the site of nutrient exchange. So carbon from the plant goes to the fungi and nutrients that the fungi take up go to the plant in this little area. Arbuscular mycorrhizas are present in herbaceous plants, uh, shrubs, and some deciduous trees. Arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi, they don't mine nutrients through the release of enzymes. They don't release enzymes at all. Instead, they are very good at scavenging nutrients released by bacteria. So our vascular mycorrhizae fungi generally require less energy or carbon um, compared to ectomycorrhizae fungi. So in a nutshell, to summarize this slide, ectomycorrhizas look and function very differently than our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, so as I mentioned, mycorrhizal fungi influence many features of ecosystem restoration, namely plant diversity and ecosystem carbon sequestration. And restoration success often hinges on these features. So the influence of mycorrhizas on plant community diversity became apparent in a seminal study done in 1998, led by a Canadian researcher, John Clernominus. So in a field experiment, Clernominus' team manipulated the number of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal species added to experimental plots representing old field ecosystems. So those old field ecosystems would look something like this, kind of like this grassland. And here, so the number of fungal species added to the plots is represented on the x-axis. So you can see that in some plots, there was no fungal species added, all the way up to some plots that received up to 14 different species of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Then each of the plots received the same mixture of seeds of 15 plant species. And what they found is that plant community diversity, so that's shown on the y-axis here, increased with the number of fungal species added to those plots. They also found that plant community productivity increased with the number of fungal species added to those plots. So here what they did is they measured the amount of vegetation produced per square meter above ground, which is shoot biomass, and below ground, which is root biomass. The lowest plant community diversity and productivity were found in those plot plots where there were no arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi added or just a few species. In contrast, the plant community productivity and diversity was highest over here when eight to 14 different species of mycorrhizal fungi were added. So these results show that both the productivity and diversity of plant communities can depend on the diversity of their vascular mycorrhizal fungi. So in simple words, plant diversity is tied to mycorrhizal fungal diversity. And there have been another of experiments since. Remember, this was done in 1998, so a um, long time ago. Jeez, this is actually what got me into mycorrhizal research was this paper. So anyway, so since then, there have been many papers done, many experiments, mostly in grasslands that show that fungal inoculations can move restored plant communities toward the plant composition found in remnant undisturbed grasslands. So these would be like our target ecosystems in restoration. However, not all disturbed ecosystems have the same response to added my adding mycorrhizal fungi. In our own research, we have found that in forests disturbed by mountain pine beetle, there is a legacy of fungi in the soil that interferes with adding mycorrhizal fungi. So in fact, in our research, Adding mycorrhizal fungi to forests disturbed by mountain pine beetle did not promote forest recovery. So we found no extra benefit of adding mycorrhizal fungi to that particular system. 
So because adding mycorrhizal fungi to ecosystems does not generate the same response everywhere, I think it's really important to ask when and where might adding mycorrhizal fungi be the most beneficial to restoration? And this is really a, a current theme in restoration research today. So that gives you a little taste on how mycorrhizal fungi influence plant communities, so diversity, productivity, but how do they influence carbon sequestration? And understanding how we can sequester more carbon in ecosystems is a very hot topic right now because it holds promise in mitigating climate change. Specifically, there has been a lot of emphasis on planting trees to mitigate climate change, but there are many questions about this approach. So for example, which species of trees do we plant? Where do we plant them? And how exactly do forests respond to elevated CO2? And in this study, so this research team tackled some of these questions. So what they did is they synthesized data from over 100 elevated CO2 experiments to see how it influences carbon stored in soils and plants. So experiments where elevated concentration, or sorry, experiments where elevated concentrations of CO2 are applied to plants have been set up all over the world. And here's an example of two, so you can see what these experiments look like. So in this one, the CO2 is applied through these towers, and then um, it's applied to the existing vegetation, whereas this a different kind of an experimental setup here where the CO2 is applied to these open top chambers and the plant communities are um, sitting inside those chambers. So what these researchers found was that the effect of elevated CO2 on soil carbon stocks was best explained by a negative relationship with plant biomass. I'm gonna walk you through this. So when plant biomass was strongly stimulated by elevated CO2, soil carbon declined. So as we're moving this way on the graph, you can see that there's this negative relationship. Conversely, when plant biomass was only weakly stimulated by elevated CO2, the soil carbon increases. So there's a trade-off between the amount of carbon stored in plants and soil under elevated CO2. So if you had to, if I could just sum that up, you know, in easy terms, you can put carbon in plants or soils, but you can't do both. And this trade-off appears to be related to how plants acquire nutrients. And this is where the mycorrhizas come in. So remember, ectomycorrhizas, they mine nutrients like nitrogen through enzyme release. So they release a bunch of enzymes to acquire that nitrogen from organic matter. Ectomycorrhizal fungi, they have to break down that organic matter to get to that nitrogen. Our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, they don't release those enzymes. They can only scavenge nutrients released by bacteria. So under elevated CO2 conditions, ectomycorrhizal plants, they increase nitrogen uptake, which increases their plant biomass. So the extra CO2, the extra carbon in the air, it fuels ectomycorrhizal fungi to take up that nitrogen, which makes their plant host grow more. But in acquiring that nitrogen, it accelerates the loss of soil organic matter, that's where the carbon is in the soil, and this reduces carbon stocks in the soil. So under elevated CO2, there is more carbon stored in plant biomass, but it's at the expense of carbon stored in soils. In contrast, our vascular mycorrhizal plants, they don't take up nitrogen in response to elevated CO2. Because they are not able to access the nitrogen in the same way as ectomycorrhizal plants can, our vascular mycorrhizal plants, they don't grow more in response to elevated CO2, but they also don't lose as much carbon from their soils. So carbon in soils is more stabilized in our vascular mycorrhizal plant communities under elevated CO2. So these results have uh, two important consequences. So first, it means that models may overestimate the potential for soil carbon sequestration in ectomycorrhizal forests. So these are our conifer forests that um, you can think about, say, in the boreal region. Second, planting ectomycorrhizal trees can in some cases actually destabilize soil organic carbon. And indiscriminately planting trees as a tool in restoration may not result in the ecosystem benefits we hope for. So, and this is all a result of how mycorrhizal fungi affect the flow of carbon in ecosystems. 
and how mycorrhizae fungi push and pull carbon in forest ecosystems is a current research topic in my lab. So to conclude, mycorrhizas, they have the power to move ecosystems closer or further away from restoration success. And while I do believe mycorrhizas have value in restoration, I think it's very important to ask under which, what conditions do we see this value? And so with that, I'm happy to take some questions on that topic. Thank you so much, Justine. That is fascinating how it varies from the different types of mycorrhizae. Uh, we are gonna start a Q&A period. So if anyone has any questions, pop them in the chat while we give people time to kind of, to brainstorm those questions, put them in there. Uh, I have one for both of you. Uh, Justine, you kind of shared this, but how did you get into this field of work? What made you want to study uh, restoration, whether that is with mycorrhizae or with uh, the ocean? Justine, do you wanna start? Sure. Uh, well, I would say my entry was definitely uh, through the, the mycorrhizas. Um, as an undergrad, I had a fabulous instructor. Her name is Heather Addy. And she had a few lectures on mycorrhizas. And I think learning about um, an organism that you don't often see and that is in such close symbiosis with another organism was just really intriguing to me. And then so the mycorrhizas is what got me there. And then the restoration, there is a, um, I think there's a lot more attention being paid to what is happening below ground and the role of microbiomes in terms of plant health. And, and so it's sort of a natural fit. And I think there's a lot of people that are sort of gravitating towards this area of research of understanding the importance of these different kinds of microbes in restoration. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and Harry. What about you? My high school biology teacher, <laughs> not specifically on coral reefs, but um, she was a marine biologist and brought a lot of marine biology examples into the classroom. Um, and actually used to live out in Banfield. So yeah. <laughs> it was meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we did have a question that kind of links the microbiome uh, between the projects. Uh, so Anari, Someone was wondering how the diff how different is the microbiome profile on the natural coral reef versus the reconstructed reef, and how does that influence kind of your results? Yeah, I did not study that, but there's actually um, an analogy that was once made to me that kind of sums this up: is that you have the bread, which is the coral, and then the peanut butter on top. So whatever it's coated in might actually really influence what kind of cues it's giving off. So we didn't study this, but we collected samples of the artificial corals um, and they're in a minus 80 at the U of A. So if anyone is interested in pursuing this research, an interesting question we had was what kind of microbiome, but also biofilm might accumulate on artificial corals. Specifically, is it potentially enhancing algae to colonize artificial corals? Um, and algae are very competitive with corals on coral reefs. So. It's, it's a little bit of an issue, but at the same time, certain types of algae are really important food source to herbivores um, on reefs. In living corals, different microbiomes certainly influence the health of the coral itself and play a role in different kinds of coral disease, for example, resist, resilience to disease um, and resilience to bleaching. Okay. And Justine, are there mycorrhizae in aquatic ecosystems, uh, do do they exist? Is that a thing? That's a good question. Um, that so I know that there is more research being done into wetlands, and uh, there are some plant species that are mycorrhizal in wetlands. Um, but I don't know very much about that. So I have really stuck to terrestrial. Um, so I, I I can't answer that question very well. Except that yes, there there are some there. Yeah. So just more research questions. That's what this panel is going to be about, coming up with all the research questions that we wish we had endless money for, which is actually another one of the questions. Uh, one of the 10 actions proposed by the UN decade on ecosystem restoration is to invest in research. If you had endless money, what is what are the research questions that you'd want to see focused on in your field of work to push uh, that area forward? 
Uh, who wants to take it first? I can, I can start. Uh, so for me, uh, number one would be uh, more research into understanding the different roles of our vascular versus ectomycorrhizal trees used in restoration. So I think it's the research is starting to emerge that say planting ectomycorrhizal trees in grasslands, not a good idea. Um, and I think that we need to understand that better. I think we also need to understand uh, when mycorrhizal fungi should be added to systems, when it's a waste of time, when it's possible they might even degrade ecosystems. And so when we're thinking about restoration, the first thing we want to do is remove threats. And there could be cases where adding uh, novel mycorrhizal fungi to a system actually is adding an invasive species. And so it's, it's thinking a lot more about the complexity. I think when people um, first learn about mycorrhizas, they hear mutualism and they think, oh, good, good for everything. Uh, and that's really not the case. And I think, uh, so I would like to see more research to understand the nuance of their role in ecosystem restoration. Absolutely. Kind of the idea of a silver bullet for any of our problems. There isn't one. It's not going to be a single recipe that works for every situation. Exactly. Uh, and Ari, what about you? Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, coral restoration itself is relatively new compared to terrestrial restoration efforts, but definitely more effort into entire community studies of what's happening at different levels. Another sort of hope spot that I find interesting, and this is a current area of research, is looking at, well, we're adding all these corals onto reefs, but if the oceans are continuing to warm, won't they just bleach at the same rate? Um, so there's a really fascinating area of research looking at coral genomics, and also looking at heat tolerance. So which coral species are heat tolerant? Um, can you confer those genes to other corals? And the, the one species that I talked about today, it's called staghorn or, or Crophora cervicornis. And it's one of the fastest growing species, which is why it's often favored. It creates a lot of habitat really quickly. But there's a lot of other slower growing species that are also really important, but understudied. So those are sort of the areas that I would I would want to look into. Again, I feel you. I used very fast growing species for Arctic restoration because you're limited by how long grad school is. But if I could study anything, it'd be how long can it last? Like what are this long growing species that I could have studied? Absolutely. Uh, and Ari, does coral reef restoration depend on what the cause of the demise was? You're talking about if, our, if the water's still increasing in temperature, uh, does the strategy you take depend on the which of the acute causes or that more chronic long-term climate change effect? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's very, it's, it's kind of a hot topic right now to sort of be asking what are our strategies? Um, and does that depend on like site specific responses? Kind of how Justine mentioned, there may not be necessarily like, oh, this is definitely positive in all circumstances. Um, but for example, for coral disease, um, there is, especially in the Florida Keys, the black band disease is of major concern and it's moving gradually and gradually further north. And so there may be, um, there's some, it's not restoration as much, but no, it's, it isn't necessarily adding more corals, but sort of trying to protect against the disease. So there's different methods depending on what you're trying to solve, I suppose. Yeah conservation, restoration, even reclamation, which is the best strategy going forward for that specific region? Absolutely. Uh, Justine, one of the questions was regarding that graph about whether the carbon was stored in the plants and the soil. Is the total amount of carbon stored the same and it just changes where it's sequestered? Um, and is it better for climate change for it to be stored in the soil or in the plants? That's a super complicated question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I'm just thinking where to start. Um, it depends. So often we want to store carbon in soils because it's, it can be a longer term pool. Right. So if you if the carbon ends up in plants and then, um, you know, the plants die and eventually 
they decompose and that carbon ends up in the atmosphere. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's just, you know, the fate of carbon. Um, whereas if we can put it in the soil, um, depending on the soil type, depending on the conditions, there's a lot of caveats to that. The carbon could stay there for longer, but sequestering carbon in soil and making it stay there longer is a very active area of research right now. And so thinking about, um, yeah, so where the carbon ends up, if it's in the plant biomass or the soil, in which one is better, which one is longer term, they're very good questions and there's no easy answer or straight answer. There's a lot of, it depends on where you are. Um, and because it depends on location and a lot of other factors, uh, that's why it's so important to, to try to get a handle on this. So when we're looking at different landscapes in different parts of the world, one solution that we propose, say for Aspen Parkland, might not be the same solution that we propose for the tropical forest. It might, in some areas, it might make more sense to get the carbon, to put the carbon in the plants versus the soils or vice versa. So it's, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, with a very, with so a very complicated answer. Um, but I think it's por in, in, very important to recognize the complexity because this goes back to what um, I would say is coming out to be a common theme is that there's not a single solution. It depends on many ecological factors. And because we're talking about restoration, we have to remember restoration is full of human values. And so it's not just thinking about what works for the ecology, it's also thinking, well, what are we trying to restore to? And there might be some situations, well, no, these are really important landscapes for a variety of human uses. And that is part of the goal. So even focusing solely on carbon, I think can there's some pitfalls. And so I would like to see restoration, you know, considering a wide range of values, not just carbon, not just the mycorrhizal the fungi, not the trees, because it's so if we weren't here, there would be no restoration. Like, and it's just allowing for that is that it's, it is steeped in human values. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that there is this other dimension that's critical to be thinking about our goals and restoration. Absolutely. Whenever I am teaching yeah, people. For sure. Yeah. Uh, about restoration, it always starts with your end land use of what's it going to be at the end. And that is entirely influenced by people. Uh, and Ari, I'm sorry for interrupting you there. Uh, you can hop in if you'd like. No, I think I had a leg, um, but I just had a comment to build off of that. I read this really great paper recently and it was talking about human values and restoration and particularly with coral restoration. A lot of the corals around the world are found around small island nations. There's also an aspect to be mindful of not sort of enforcing eco-imperialism or ongoing colonization by kind of coming in and saying, this is the best method that you have to employ here. So you have to listen to us because we're Western scientists and we know this. So it's definitely taking the local context into consideration too and like social and cultural values and who's doing the restoration, who's actually planning it and all these kind of really interesting concepts to consider. Absolutely. Part of restoration that is hopefully increasing is incorporating that that human component, especially the local uh, local focus. Uh, so again, we've talked so much about all those research questions that still exist and how there isn't a solution that we can just tell people, given the short timeline of the decade of ecological restoration or ecosystem restoration, how can we move forward effectively to take action while still needing to address all of these research questions at the same time? Uh, Anari, do you wanna take this one first? Sure. Um, I think what's really special with like thinking about research and everyone sort of doing their part and everyone tackling the, the decade of restoration and 10 years to sort of change our trajectory from on an uninhabitable planet is like, we know the science, first of all, like it's great to put resources into restoration and understanding how do we restore degraded habitats, but cutting fossil fuels emissions has to also be a huge priority at the same time. So supporting work for people who are pushing for more bold climate policy, for example, that has to be like equally paired with restoring. So it's yes, reducing the amount of fossil fuel emissions, by looking at interesting methods of carbon capture, but also just 
stopping stop expanding that industry, for example, and transition into renewable resources. And there's a lot of really interesting research there as well. Absolutely. Justine, do you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I might add, I, I agree. Um, and I would say uh, very recently I was probably fall more into the camp of being skeptical and cynical about what exactly humans can do in such a short time period. Uh, but then along came COVID. And, you know, when we think about how much has happened and, you know, in terms of the science and the research and humans coming together to solve a problem, it is, I mean, it has been phenomenal and it's been tremendous in terms of when you just look at how far and all the things that have happened in the past like 15 60 months and so i guess so when i step back and look at what we've been able to do as a society um in response to covid there obviously we have so much potential in terms of turning things around or responding to things that we really care about and have to care about and so yeah so i think as much as I, you know, I, I don't want to say that there's any silver lining of COVID, but seeing this unfold has moved me, definitely moved me more into a hopeful category of what we can do um, in response to, to restoring ecosystems, to conserving climate change, all of that. But it is really, I think, uh, building up the, the willpower. Yeah. Absolutely. That was actually one of the questions I had written in advance before we even talked is what lessons can we learn from COVID for guiding our restoration forward in the next decade? And a lot of it really comes down to coming together as a global group and dealing with it uh, and that communication, uh, really figuring out how do we communicate so that everyone's on the same page. Uh, and Ari, did you want to add anything from that kind of COVID perspective? No, I agree that it kind of just does to goes to show that change can happen quickly. Change has happened quickly in the past. Um, similar to my results, it can be a non-linear response. <laughs> so definitely supporting how that can happen is exciting. Uh, jumping into that nonlinear response, I know I had a bunch of messages of people who wanted to understand your nonlinear results. So if you want to share that, that would be amazing. Yeah, I had to cut out some of those slides for time, but um, sure, I can, here, I can share my screen. I just have a few little images to help and I can talk about the three main. Yeah, so why, right? Why is it nonlinear? Um, so we kind of came up with a couple of different avenues of exploration. And so the first one could be that there could be some kind of density dependent effect. So essentially competition where the, the coral clusters that are made of entirely living coral are being filled up faster. But if that were the case, I would have expected to see a bit of a linear trend here where 100, 70, 50 going down. So then probably the mechanism that I think is at play here. Oh, sorry, spot's taken. Um, probably the mechanism at play here could be trait specific or species specific responses. So for example, juvenile fish that have different kind of aggregating behaviors. So if you're in a school versus if you're solitary, if you're together, you have a bit more protection against predation. Um, versus if you're solitary, you might not care what that coral is made out of. You need to hide as soon as you can. The other kind of trait that I'll be exploring or what about fishes that have high sight fidelity? So these tiny little cryptobenthic, so really hard to see, or certain kinds of damselfish that are very territorial, they might care a little bit more about what their habitat is made out of if they don't move around a lot. Um, so that will be a future avenue of analyses and, and research for me. And then the other sort of mechanism could be indirect cues. So that's where like attracts like and discourages other kinds of species. Um, so that'd be density independent, but it's show, there's quite a bit of research on coral reefs showing that indirect cues can be really important for attraction and repelling of different kinds of species. So very brief little um, images there to show why I think that might be happening. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. I know we had a lot of people very interested. Yeah. Uh, Justine, 
I had a question of where do you get mycorrhizae? Like if you want to incorporate them into your restoration project, how do you source that? Um, yeah, so there's different ways of doing that. So you could take, um, so one popular approach is to take, say, small amounts of soil from your reference ecosystem uh, and use that to inoculate, say, plants or the ref your restored ecosystem. So that's one you're just transferring soil around. And in some occasions, that works really well. So especially for grasslands, we've seen a lot of success in using soils to inoculate that carry the fungi. Other ecosystems like uh, say our mountain pine beetle killed stands, that doesn't work so well. Um, and just that there's no added benefit of transferring soils. Uh, the seedlings don't grow better if you provide it or not. The other way is to culture fungi. So this is more straightforward um, in ectomycorrhizae fungi where you can culture them, culture them on little plates. Our vascular mycorrhizae fungi, you could, um, it's a different kind of culturing where you're basically amplifying the number of spores and then using spores. Uh, and then of course there's commercial inoculum, um, but I have uh, strong feelings about commercial inoculum and um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> But um, but basically, I think the goal is usually to somehow capture the native fungi in your restoration site and be using them to inoculate, say, seedlings that you're putting in. Uh, it sounds like a lot of the same issues of using native species in restoration is is where to source them and yeah. Yeah, it's very it's a very similar story to thinking about how you get seeds, which seeds. Some plants are really difficult, right? You, it's very tough to get seeds or, you know, they don't germinate. It's the same thing with mycorrhizae fungi. It's a uh, very similar issues and conversations. Just the biology is a little bit different. Absolutely. All right, we have a few minutes left. Uh, the last question submitted from our audience is, do you ever experience climate grief while studying ecosystems at risk due to climate change? Do you have any advice on, on managing that? Uh, Anari, do you want to go first? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's so real and scary. Um, it can feel very much like out of your control, and so like you know, it can very easily lead to the spiral. Lead to the spiral, of like like what can I be doing or whatever. And I think that is where I can I recognize for myself that I can take those feelings where I feel a lot of grief and powerlessness and I can sort of channel those until okay like what am I actually doing about this and one of the ways that has helped me the most is um acting with other people you you don't have to do this alone like there are so many people like everyone here find a group of people with similar values to yours start looking around seeing who's already doing what how can I help them with, with what they're already doing and there's a lot of great groups even in Edmonton Edmonton um, doing some great work. If you're interested, I'd recommend checking out Climate Justice Edmonton. Um, they do some really fantastic work there, but also think about like, what are your skills and what do you enjoy doing and how can you bring that to the movement? So yeah, that's what helps me. Amazing. My next question was gonna be, how can we all individually become leaders in generation restoration? But that, you've answered that, all of those things. Uh, Justine, anything to add on that climate grief and what can we do? I think those are some good tips. Um, I think um, I personally um, get so intrigued and curious when I'm in nature that most of those sorts of feelings go away very quickly. Um, and for me, it is, um, I mean, my research is very important. I love what I do and I'm very curious about it. Um, but really, probably the most impact I have in my career is on the students I teach. And so for me, I think about how many students each year I interact with, which is probably about 300 new faces every year. And if I can pass on that spark of curiosity, um, I think that is... I don't know, I guess one of the, in my mind, a good way to kind of rise above that. And um, yeah, and because I think often it's it's not the the negatives that inspire us to do more, it's it's the positives. And, and uh, so I, I try to focus on that. Um, and definitely 
um, thinking about my role as an instructor and uh, teaching and yeah, and, and passing on that spark and, or just growing that spark. I mean, with mycorrhizas, I know that many of my students will come into my classes, they've never heard of them. And I, I hope when they leave that I can share some of my interests so that when they're digging around in the soil next time, they can be like, oh, I remember she said something about roots and mycorrhizas, like what is going on there? And um, yeah, and so I would hope that just that, that little spark of curiosity helps people move through that, that anxiety and that, that grief. Um, but I, I don't know if that works for everybody. That's, that's just me. No, oh, absolutely. That's my favorite part of working in outreach and teaching kids about land reclamation and restoration is there's a whole group of people that now think about it in their lives. Uh, we are out of time, but any last comments you'd like to share with our audience, last thoughts on your area of work, uh, the UN Decade of Restoration? Uh, Justine, if you have anything. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> no last comments for me. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and I'd also, also like to thank Inuria. I really loved your presentation and learning about corals. I just, I think, is really fascinating. So thank you very much for having me here. Well, thank you. Inuria, any last comments? Any last goodbyes? No, same. This is so fascinating. I think it's really special to see really similar threads across ecosystem and restoration, just thinking about context and so many different factors, all those positive, positive feedback loops in nature and with people. So um, I'm all about that. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for joining us today. And thank you everyone for joining us for the World Environment Day. We hope that you can take what you've learned to become part of Generation Restoration yourself. And I'm gonna pass the mic off to Allison for closing remarks. Thanks everyone. Um, and thank you, especially to Justine, Aneri, and Valerie for a wonderful conversation. I, I certainly learned a lot today too.